I have proposed that uh, there be an entirely new kind of college entrance examination in which instead of answering a lot of silly questions, you write for about 20 pages on your idea of paradise. It can be any kind of paradise you want. It can be very spiritual, it can be very sensuous. But spell it out. What do you want to happen in life? And then you will hand this thesis in to an assigned tutor on the faculty. And he'll read it over and examine you closely as to whether this is what you really want. Do you realize, for example, what goes with the things you say you desire? I mean, for example, you uh, want to marry a certain kind of beautiful woman and you specify in your paper the characteristics she should have. But, says the tutor, you said absolutely nothing about her mother. Her mother. Because every girl goes with a mother. I mean, unless she's an orphan. And you must also specify what kind of mother-in-law you want. Well, then you have to stop and think about that. And that's just an illustration of going into detail and being very careful about what you desire. Because there's a good saying, be careful of what you desire. You may get it. Thebes, let's face it. There is a doctrine in the Jewish religion that when God created Adam, he put into him a spirit which is called the Yetzahara, and that means the wayward spirit, or what I call the element of irreducible rascality. And that is in us all. Uh, a little bit. It's not the whole of us. It's like just a pinch of salt in the stew. And you don't want the whole stew to be salt. But you have to have just a touch of rascality to be human. And I find it difficult to get along with people who don't know that they have it. People who come on that they're all sincere, all good, all pure, bore me to death and scare me. <laughs> as they, they're unconscious of themselves and therefore they suddenly do terrible things without warning either to themselves or to others they make promises that they're never going to fulfill because they want to talk right and so if I do business with someone who is not really aware that he's a rascal I know he's impossible to do business with. He'll suddenly cheat me completely. But if I'm aware that he's a bit of a shyster, I feel comfortable. And I let him know that I am too. Then we're human. Then we can let our hair down. Then we can say, look, let's work this out. This is what I want. And I know what you want. And if we can get that clear, we can work out a reasonable agreement. We can compromise. We have a little play of give and take. But if you don't have that, you're absolutely snarled. see, a lot of people don't feel happy unless they have another thing beyond money, which is called status. And status 
to a very large extent in our economy consists in conspicuous consumption. In having this thing and that thing and the other thing, in having a swimming pool, a uh, Ferrari, uh, a certain kind of clothes and uh, a certain kind of house with an enormous round style picture window and so on and so on and so on. And we think uh, we need all that because we've been persuaded by a certain kind of propaganda that that's how we ought to live. Because we haven't asked ourselves whether that was what we really wanted. In other words, we've been propagandized into thinking what we wanted. Our Because if you can't trust other people, you cannot have a community, not even a corporation. It's risky, very risky to trust other people, because they may let you down. But on the whole, if you do trust them, the chances are perhaps what, 60 to 40, maybe a little more, maybe 75 to 25, that the system will work, simply because they are trusted. insisted that she had to have a certain number of cashmere sweaters. In those days, I couldn't afford them. I said, my dear, do you really want these? Or is it just that um, you've been reading ads in the magazine or listening to the other children? Because you see, schools are places where you send your child to be brought up by other children. And therefore, they get a kind of lowest common denominator of culture. <laughs> they all think they got to have this, they got to have that. And uh, they don't really want it. If they sat back and considered, do I need all that? Is this trip really necessary? They would come to the conclusion that it wasn't. When you're challenged to, to be perfectly genuine, it's like saying to a child, now darling, come out here and play and don't be self-conscious. <laughs> or it's like I would say to you, now look, if you come here tonight at exactly midnight and put your hands on this stage, you can wish and have granted any wish you want, provided you don't think of a green elephant. <laughs> <laughs> and so everybody will come They'll put their hands here, and they will be very careful not to think about a green elephant. <laughs> well, now do you see the point? That everybody, if we transfer this to the dimension of spirituality, where the highest ideal is to be unselfish, to let go of oneself, 
When you are trying to be unselfish, you're doing it for a selfish reason. You can't be unselfish by a decision of the will any more than you can decide not to think of a green elephant. So after a while, you see, what happens is this. When the student finds that there is absolutely no way of being his true self, not only is there no way of doing it, there is also no way of doing it by not doing it. You can't do it by doing something. You can't do it by not doing something. Let me, to make this clearer, put it into Christian terms. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God. Now what are you going to do about that? If you try very hard to love God and you ask yourself, why am I doing this? You find out you're doing it because you want to be on the side of the big battalions. You want to be right. After all, the Lord is the master of the universe, isn't he? And if you don't love him, you're going to be in a pretty sad state. So you realize I'm loving him just because I'm afraid of what will happen to me if I don't. And then you think that's pretty lousy love, isn't it? And you think I, 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 that's a bad motivation. I wish I could change that. I wish I could love the Lord out of a genuine heart. Well, why do you want to change? There is no independent self to be produced. There is no way at all of showing it. It's because it isn't there. So you recover from the illusion. And you suddenly wake up and think, oh, what a relief. don't change. We're doing the same thing today, but under different names. We can look back at those people and see how evil that was, but we can't see it in ourselves. So therefore, beware of virtue. Lao Tzu, the Chinese philosopher, said, the highest virtue is not virtue, and therefore really is virtue. But inferior virtue cannot let go of being virtuous, and therefore is not virtue. Translated uh, in more of a periphrastic way, the highest virtue is not conscious of itself as virtue, and therefore really is virtue. 
lower virtue is so self-conscious that it's not virtue. In other words, when you breathe, you don't congratulate yourself on being virtuous. But breathing is a great virtue. It's living. When you come out with beautiful eyes, blue or brown or green as the case may be, you don't congratulate yourself for having grown one of the most fabulous jewels on earth. So it's just eyes. And you don't account it a virtue to see, to entertain the miracles of color and form. You say, oh, that's just... But that's real virtue. Virtue in the sense, the old sense of the word, a strength, is when we talk about the healing virtue of a plant. That's real virtue. So you see here again, the problem comes out in genetics. We do not really know how to interfere with the way the world is. The way the world actually is, is an enormously complex interrelated organism. In giving away the control, you got it. You got the kind of control you wanted. That's to say, where you had a loving relationship to the world, but you didn't have to make up your mind what it should do. <laughs> you let it decide. More, therefore, you relinquish power, trust others, the more powerful you become, but in such a way that instead of having to lie awake nights controlling everything, you do it beautifully by trusting the job to everyone else. And they carry it on.
So when we decide, we're always worrying. Did I think this over long enough? Did I take enough data into consideration? And if you think it through, you find you never could take enough data into consideration. The data for a decision in any given situation is infinite. So what you do is you go through the motions of thinking out what you will do about this. And then when the time comes to act, you make a snap judgment. <laughs>
Now that's compassion. In the real sense of the word, feeling with and through someone else. Where the whole trick is that you lose control for a while of the situation and say, I throw the ball to you, now it's yours. give the power away what you're really doing is you're othering yourself now the more you other yourself by giving power away the more of a self you are because self and other are reciprocal that you can't outwit yourself. You can't be, shall I say, unself-conscious on purpose. You can't be designedly spontaneous. And you cannot be genuinely loving by intending to love. Either you love someone or you don't. If you pretend to love a person, you deceive them and build up reasons for resentment.
doing business such as um, manufacturing uh, clothes is a very good thing to do. I could conceive that it would be extremely enjoyable, something one could be very proud of, to make good clothes. Of course you need to sell them because you need to eat. But to make clothes to make money raises another question. Because then your interest is not in making clothes, it's in making money, and then you're going to cheat on the clothes. And then you get an awful lot of money and you don't know what to do with it. You can't, you can't eat ten roasts of beef in one day. You can't live in six houses at once. You can't drive three Rolls Royces at the same time. What are you to do? Well, you can just go make more money. You put your money back. Invest it in something else and it'll make more. And you don't give a damn how it's made so long as they make it. You don't care if they foul the rivers, put oil fumes throughout the air everywhere, kill off all the fish. So not, so long as you see these figures happening. You're not aware of anything else. So you see, you went out to do a self-improvement thing. Making money, you see, is a measure of improvement. A measure of your economic worthwhileness. Well, at least that's what it's supposed to be. It isn't anything of the kind. But you went out, in other words, for the status instead of for the actuality. So here's the situation, you see. There is no, the, the, the whole idea of self-improvement is a, uh, is a will-o'-the-wisp and a hoax. But a naturalistic or organic view of karma is, in fact, that what happens to me 
is what I do. And that in a certain sense, uh, I want what happens to me. We can use want, notice how we use this word. It means to desire and it means to lack or to need. We say to somebody, you're wanting, you're deficient in something that you need. So it's rather alarming, really, when you consider it, that uh, you always get what you want, invariably. Even though you may think that it's entirely opposed to your wishes. But if it's your karma, everything that happens to you, put it in another way, everything that comes to you is a return to you of what goes out of you. That doing as you will isn't a new kind of behavior that you suddenly put on and say from now on I'm going to go around doing as I will. You have to realize first that that's what you've always been doing. And you can look at this from a very simple point of view. It's not a complete point of view. But you can say, well, now, what about the people who, who did good and who did the things that they didn't want to do? You know, everybody's mother said to us, darling, sometimes we have to do things we don't like. Well, what about that? Well, you can always say, the kid obeyed the mother and did the thing that he didn't like because that was the better part of wisdom. In other words, if he hadn't done that, something worse would have happened. And we choose the lesser of two evils. And when you find yourself in a situation where you have to choose the lesser of two evils, then you say, I want out of here. And you take the easiest way, you take the line of least resistance. So that's your doing. When you are aware of I, you are aware of a dis basic discomfort, which is located basically between the eyes, somewhere in here, a sort of tightness. Also, it's in other centers too, it's uh, in the solar plexus, 
and uh, there are various physical centers, in other words, where this constant tension or resistance against it is going on. And that's what you feel when you talk about I. When that tension ceases, you discover immediately that the separate ego has disappeared and that what I refers to is simply the total panorama of experience, everything that's happening. That's I.